Bishop, I I failed God. What is going on with Candace Owens and the Daily Wire, this recent fracture that we're seeing within the conservative community? And does that say anything about what's happening in the body of Christ? Particularly, what about the reason for the division? Does it have anything to do with Israel? We're going to be talking about that and much, much more because our guest tonight has such an eclectic background from broadcasting to ancient Hebrew studies. We're going to look at the news of the day and compare it to the covenants of God throughout history and what that says about the last days. But first, before we dive into that, have you gotten Encounter Coffee yet? EncounterCoffee.com. Head over there and take a look at the Wigglesworth Blend, Azusa Street Mornings. You don't need to give your money to woke companies any longer who despise your faith. We can build the kingdom of God together by building a parallel economy. Get your coffee. Get the Wigglesworth Blend. That's my favorite. Or Azusa Street Mornings. They're both amazing, top-of-the-line coffee blends we think will be a blessing to you. Or you could get the Wigglesworth Mo- Mug as a gift for those that you love. So without further ado, let's dive into this conversation with a man who's really on the forefront of what's happening culturally in the United States and around the world. Here he is, Pastor Greg Stevens. Pastor Greg Stevens, it is so thrilling to have you on Encounter today. Thank you, Bishop. It's an honor to be here. Well, there's so much I want to talk to you about because you have such a such a uh, eclectic background and there's so much going on in the news right now. And later, I want to talk to you kind of about a surreal moment uh, when you're at a game and you get a phone call from Kenneth Copeland and what happens after that. But first, you, you've become a prominent voice for righteousness in the culture with Victory News. Victory News has just kind of been this juggernaut that's come out of nowhere. Uh, where did Victory News come from and how has it become so successful? It came from the heart of Kenneth Copeland, if you want to be honest with it. Uh, We didn't plan. Let's make a network and then let's start news. News is very expensive. And once you start it, you're committed. It's not like something you can start and then stop. And and we have the most talented people. We have actual Emmy Award winning people that work uh, uh, correspondents and um, uh, producers. I mean, they're the real deal that that came in here to do this. It was born out of actually the election and all the misinformation and all the news. And somebody needed to give a biblical worldview and a constitutional worldview to what's happening in America and around the world. And that's what we do. We take the news. We read it uh, just like everybody else does. We we do our fact checks. We we research. We study the stories. And then we look at it through a biblical lens. What does this mean for the body of Christ? What does this mean uh, for righteousness? And so that's the way we present it. We don't say we're fair and balanced. We're not. (laughs) We lean toward what Scripture says and toward the Constitution when we report the news. How desperately is that needed going into 2024 with the rise of AI and the misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, how it's all being categorized right now for you guys to be where you are? How does someone like you, who has an extensive background and knowledge of the Hebrew language, of Hebrew customs, of the covenants of God, how do you get on a news program? Okay, well, it started. It's funny how God does things because your steps, plural, are ordered of the Lord, not your step. Mm. We have too many people today trying to take a step. And uh, no, you have to take the steps. I can't step to the top of a 10-foot ladder. I have to take the first and the second and the third. Wow. Yes. And they correspond. So my steps began right, right in high school. Um, I began doing some radio things with a friend of mine. And um, we began, then I got a job working on radio and uh, beautiful music for beautiful people. You know, the overnight stuff, <laughs> and, you know, nobody's listening to you. And um, that's what I did going to college and all. And I decided that's what I wanted to do. That was the career path I was going to follow. I was going to become uh, a broadcast journalist. I was, you know, radio to television and told was told by a news director one time that I have the perfect face for radio. I'm not good enough for television. <laughs> and uh, so I followed a different path and got involved with Christian television when it came to our city. And uh, I walked away from all of that uh, when, you know, going into ministry. And I thought those days were gone until I was approached as pastor in San Diego by a Spanish radio station. Would you do your church service in Spanish? I said, I don't speak Spanish. They said, it doesn't matter. Speak English. 
And so the steps you go on ahead of syndicated uh, television, radio program, rather not television, radio program in San Diego, when I ran for public office, they said, wouldn't it be kind of cool if a pastor could talk about these things? And I thought, well, all right, let's do that. And long story short, I ended up moving from California back to uh, the middle part of the country here in Fort Worth, Texas. And God decided, let's do Christian news. And here I am. What I started all those years ago, I have white hair now. It was a long time ago <laughs> as a kid doing radio. Now here I am using what I thought I would never use again, but now for the kingdom rather than the, the way I used to use it. Wow. He does all things well and how he's ordered your steps to be such an influential voice now at this time and season. I wondered, as you were saying that, who were some of the journalists who influenced you growing up? And what are some of the news sources that you go to? Like, where do you pull from when you're getting news? Okay, so when I was real young, uh, on our television every night was Walter Cronkite. Yes. Um, that was that was when I was really young. I would watch that, and I would watch the uh, the coverage from Vietnam because we had family there. And, and so I remember those early influences of that. Um, I was fortunate enough to, to meet a person, watch them work. And, and she ended up a uh, local station, but she ended up being entertainment tonight, Mary Hart. Really? Um, and several of people that I was working around and, and people that had a lot of knowledge. And so those, the, I think the fair, the fair people, when you look back, the, the Russerts of the world, um, mm -hmm. the David Brinkley's, you didn't really know. They didn't have an agenda. It didn't seem like that they do today. And I think we've lost that. Today, we have people that call themselves journalists. They're not. They're pundits. And they have a journalist title next to their name. And, and we don't have that that person that, that can report factually what's happening without slanting at a direction. And uh, so I think those guys have always been the influence to me. I tell you another one. My grandfather always listened to Paul Harvey. And Paul so, Harvey. Yeah. Paul, uh, yeah. Not, now you know the rest of the story. <laughs> and so Harvey was another one of those that was kind of an influencer in that regard. There's people today don't even know who I'm talking about when you mention these names. But there was an honesty about it. You held the government officials accountable. You told the truth. And uh, and move forward. I think um, Watergate influenced me. I remember watching that as a kid. I remember watching the OJ trial, you know, on television. I realized how much television and the media shapes our world yes. and our life. And um, so now to be part of it is, is amazing. Okay, so you ask how we get our things. Um, yeah, we we were part of the Associated Press. Uh, so we see the exact same things everyone else sees. We have contacts. Uh, we, we have contacts with CBN. Um, we, Chris Mitchell of CBN Jerusalem, he reports on Victory News from time to time. We have a work, great working relationship with CBN. So we see the, all the same stories that everyone else sees. And, uh, we have our own tip line that we now have for people to report things that are happening in their community. And um, we we vet them. I mean, we check it out. We if there's certain I won't I don't want to name any sources here, but if there's stories from certain stories from certain places, we'll make sure that there's two or three and not just report on the one, because everything you That's see good. online nowadays, you can't fully believe. So we'll we'll look and see if it's a credible source. We'll, we'll always do what two or three, and, and that's scriptural, isn't it? And the, yes. out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall a thing be established, it says in Scripture. So we always look to see two or three credible sources for a story before we ever run with it. Well, with your finger on the pulse of what's happening culturally, what would you tell Americans right now to be looking for? Like, watch for this, or I believe that this is going to be happening around the corner, that the body of Christ needs to be prepared for this uh, news wise and culturally, what do you see coming around the corner? People are confused um, and uh, they they like uh, social media is great, but it's also a two edged sword here and, and not great. And the fact that people do a lot of things for clicks now, mm -hmm. you know, to, to be an influencer uh, more of that. But I, AI's component of that, I think AI is a very scary thing Um not to be a fear person, but it, it's frightening because the ability to determine what's true. Yes. Knowing 
truth, that there is absolute truth, Bishop. We have to realize that thy word is truth. We have to read. That's where we're going to have to judge everything by, by the word pretty soon. That that truth is an absolute. We all believe in absolute truth, even though people say they don't. If you, I don't know if you're a musician or not. I want to be a musician, but I'm not. I can play but the radio. All guitars have a, a G string on them, you know, that G note. And no matter if you play country or rock or classical or in a symphony or in New York, Nashville or L.A., G has to be tuned to G. Yes. So we accept standards and truth. But we've been taught not to accept it in various corners of our world. Staying with truth is going to be critical in the days to come as the Lord tarries. And the more that we do, the more persecution that's going to stir up and the dust that's going to stir up as a result of that. Namely, what we've seen recently with the Daily Wire, a prominent conservative network. And we see Candace Owens all all of a sudden ousted, potentially as a result of her comments surrounding Israel and that kind of thing. Not that I entirely agree with some of her comments, but it's interesting to watch when we when we need and we're vying for tolerance and we're vying for freedom of speech to see these conservative voices breaking apart. I wonder from your perspective, kind of being in the know, what do you think is happening with Candace Owens there and why was she let go? You know, I don't know. I don't know the whole story about any of it. I know this. She's very outspoken. Yeah. Uh, you look at Tucker Carlson. He was outspoken. Glenn Beck was outspoken. And there comes a time when you're when you're speaking outspoken, even at Fox News, mm-hmm. um, those people are on the out, aren't they? Yes. Um, Glenn's no longer there. Tucker's no longer there. And I think that's the thing that we're going to have to watch. We are the United States. And if you look at Scripture, unity is a key. Unity is a key to a nation, but it's key to the people of God. And unity is the key. Um, well, Psalm 133, I'm blessed. Uh, how good it is when brothers dwell together in unity. And he said it's like the anointing that falls on Aaron on his head, Mm. his beard, shoulders, all the way down. So no matter where you are in the body, the anointing is there. The the attack is on the head, always. Uh, When you got out of the shower this morning, what did you dry first? You dry your head off. You, You always dry your head. So... This is why we're to pray for those in leadership. Yeah. That, we always do that for the government, but we rarely do that with spiritual leadership. We need to be praying for spiritual leadership from the head. That's where that's going to be. And so then the, then the psalmist did something really crazy, talking about all of this anointing running down to the very hem of the garment. And he starts talking about the dew on Mount Hermon. And I thought, what does that have to do with anything? That's, that's a mountain in Israel, northern Israel. Mm-hmm. And then I was talking to a meteorologist one day, and he said, well, it's the dew point. And I said, excuse me? It's the dew point. There's a temperature, that atmosphere, the, this room right now, your room that you're in, the people that are watching right now, the room they're in, there is a humidity temperature in that room. And if you get the temperature right, the water molecules will form dew. It's like the dew on Mount Hermon. There is a temperature of unity. That's what that was all about. Come on. And if, yes. you, can get, if you can get people in a church service or in a meeting to get in unity, at some point, a suddenly will happen. Mm. They'll reach that unity temperature, that dew point for the room. People that were heathens got in unity in Babylon, and God said, we need to go see what's going on. Unity is the key. That's why this nation was named United States. That's why we fought a civil war to divide us. And the conservatives... Be it, be it a church, be it a news network, we, we're on guard here. We cannot allow a division and strife to get in, wedged in between producers, wedged in between the people that present the news and the writers. We've got to stay in unity. And that's the attack, I believe, that the enemy will use on um, Newsmax, on Fox, on any of them. And it, it, Candace, I don't know the details of it, sure, but that's the thing that that concerns me. We must remain united, people of like precious faith. Long answers for somebody no, who so good. Somebody who who interviews people and wants short answers. I'm going very long. I apologize. No, luckily we've got all the time in the world, so we can we can just get some in depth. That's why we want you on here, so we can have a long form conversation. It's fascinating to me that this division is coming over Israel when the Bible predicts that it will be a stone of stumbling and a rock of yep. offense and. And we're seeing this. I was just talking with Tom Hughes from 
hope for our times. And we were talking about the anti-Semitism that has always been there in the world. But something seems to be happening in the last year, even more recently, where it's seeping into the church. Do you see that? And how do we guard against it? What should be our position on the nation of Israel? The nation of Israel, our position is clear. Uh, the Bible makes it very clear. Yes. We were grafted into the covenant of Abraham mm-hmm. in Christ Jesus. That's what I call the new covenant. I, you know, people always refer to the new covenant, the old covenant. I call it the new covenant of Abraham in Christ Jesus. Wow. Because Galatians, like Galatians three says, curses everyone in the hands of the tree. The blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentile. Jesus did not take me to Moses. He took me to Abraham, which is a covenant of faith. Hmm. People of faith, we are the we are spiritual seed of Abraham. We're part of that covenant. That's our brothers. Uh, Joseph re- revealed himself to his brothers, and and they saw that covenant mark in Joseph's body, and they re- realized, oh wow, this is a here's an Egyptian pharaoh that's been circumcised, and he spoke to them then in their language, and they heard it. We've been grafted into this thing, and as a result of it, we're the younger brother. And it is incumbent upon us to bless and stay alongside the older brother, if you will. And uh, that's not an option. Um, Jesus talks about those of you on my right and my left when he when he does his final judgment. I don't think it's a coincidence. He says right and left. The right believe in life. The right support wow. Israel. It's, it's the left that doesn't support Israel largely. And it, he said, as long as you've done this to, to my brothers, you've done this unto me. Um, that's my brother. That's my spiritual brother. I can explain Judaism had Christianity never happened. I cannot explain Christianity had there never been mm. Judaism. Uh, we're from the same root. We didn't replace them. God hadn't thrown them away. Uh, we are in our time until the age of the Gentile, the church age. And once we're removed, they'll they'll once again take over. Uh, evangelizing the world. So um, long story short, again, here I do. I'm doing it again. <laughs> we have a covenant. They had. They were people. Ephesians chapter 2 talks about one time we were strangers and aliens of, of the covenants of Israel. Now we've been brought nigh by the blood of the Lamb. We didn't have a covenant. They did. But mm-hmm. both of us needed this new covenant. We needed this reconciliation of God to himself. We have to stand together. We're great Satan, they're little Satan, and the enemies of righteousness want both of us gone. You know, I want to dig a little deeper into that because you mentioned the, how did you say it, the new covenant, the new covenant of Abraham in Christ Jesus? That's what I call it. Yeah, the new covenant of Abraham. I've heard you say, I believe, that in your Bible between the Old and New Testament, you just have an arrow. Um, I drew a big line. I did. A big line, yeah. It's It's a big arrow pointing this way because I spent so much of my life, um, Bishop, I I failed God. Mm. I failed my calling because of the denomination I grew up in. I could no longer do what I was called to do at age 13 at a little Pentecostal youth camp. I couldn't do ministry, and my church told me so. Wow. Um, and it was divorce. Mm-hmm. And um, if I'd have killed her and gone to prison, I'd have a testimony. You know, but but because of that, and so I just decided I'm not going to be a hypocrite, and I just became a heathen mm. and went full bore heathen for a, for many many years, and just uh, denied God. My dog tags in the military said no religion on them. Um, mm. They said no, you can't be. You got to be Catholic. You got to be Jewish. You got to be Christian. You got to be. I said nothing. Put nothing. And it was a big fight, but that I left him, but he never left me. Wow! And I I was used to religion, uh, not relationship. Rules without relationship brings rebellion. Yes, and that's exactly what happened to me. That's exactly what's happened to Israel so many times. Rules without relationship brings rebellion, and they would always go into captivity. But in saying that, and I really. Felt impressed to say that because I believe there's somebody else that was like me in that regard. Yes, you're that. not you're not on the dustbin. God will renew that calling. That thing never left me, and and I'm doing it today. I'm doing it in a different form, but I'm pastoring today. I'm just pastoring 
during the news mm. of all crazy things. And so in saying this, we have a country that's sick and broken. We have a church that I believe in many ways is broken, and we've got to unite around what we can unite around. America has to remain united to Israel. America has to remain united to our covenant. We have to, George Washington made a covenant for this nation on the day he was sworn in. He said, you will be our God and we will be your people. There it is. There's our first covenant. Yes. When he swore on the Bible, it put his hand on Genesis 17. That's where God had made covenant with Abraham. And so he knew what he was doing. This is probably where hated so much. We're people of the book, just like Israel is people of the book. And Lucifer has always, because if he can destroy Israel's place, he can destroy your place, then God's a liar. But he's always watching over his word to perform it. And he's watching over America and he's watching over us. I have hope in all of these things because of our covenant, because of the covenant God made with Abraham and then ratified that covenant with me in Christ Jesus. You have hope, and I do as well, because you understand covenant. And for many, as as Ephesians 2 says, this is a strange covenant. They're strangers to it, meaning the concept of covenant is strange to many believers, which, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, he's just written with Kenneth Copeland an amazing book, God, the Covenant, and the Contradiction. It's one of the meatiest books I've dove into in a long, long time. The link's in the description. And I want to talk to you about this a little bit, because I think it's important Tell us, tell us first of all about your history because you're 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 a specialist in in Hebrew uh, traditions and in the Hebrew language. Where did this passion for these things come from? It started with my my mother and her mother. Uh, it began as a little boy with them, and um, and uh, the Jewish friends that I had and that I was around, and I was sent to school with them uh, to learn. And uh, so I went to, I literally went to Sunday school, uh, with, uh, my Jewish friends and, and I began to learn a long time ago some things that my mother put in me. Um, not to be too graphic, uh, just like Paul, I was born on a Sunday and was in church the next Sunday. <laughs> but, but mother, my mother decided. And then that Monday on the eighth day, um, I was circumcised according to, and my mother made sure that happened. Um, so I was always never had a bar mitzvah, but was trained as a young boy always uh, about this heritage. And so as a result of it, later on in life, like I said, when I was hurt and wounded, I decided to convert. I didn't. I left that part out. I didn't know we were going there, but I'll, I'll share it now. I, I decided to convert to Judaism. Wow. I did everything I could to convert. And they wouldn't take me. <laughs> and so that's when I decided I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I'll just be a heathen. And so I walked away mm. from everything. When I got back with God, I, I I was in Desert Storm, and I was in Saudi Arabia, uh, and where you're not allowed, where Christians are not allowed, God's not allowed there. I don't know if he doesn't know that. But I opened a Bible that my, my mother gave to me that I carried with me, and it fell open to Timothy where it says, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, the things taught to you, paraphrasing, teach also to faithful men also. For the first time, Bishop, in about a decade, I cried. And I said, God, I don't believe you. You know that. But if you're really real, because I'm mad at myself for crying, mm-hmm. I, said, I, could, I, I could take you to the bomb shelter I was sitting in by myself. You guys were holding a party because the war was over, you know, and I was still there. And I said, God, if you're really real, kill me right now. I, I dare you. I curse you. I dare you to do it. At least I'll know. And thank God he doesn't answer stupid prayers. Wow. Yes. And at that moment, I said, okay, I, that feeling I had when I was 13 came back and I said, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it, but I don't want any hype. And what I didn't tell you is in my flight squadron over there, I was with an ORU graduate and a Rama graduate in my flight squadron. And I'm like, I hate these people. <laughs> I want away from these weirdos. Wow. But I saw my first believers in a long, long time. They weren't religious, but they they were living it. And I thought, if I can be like that, if I can be like that captain right there, okay. 
And I started the journey right then. That's how I came back. So I tried to convert. As I was going forward uh, with training with Brother Hagen, had the privilege of traveling with him some and um, and oh, wow. became a pastor, remarried, beautiful wife, 28 years now, three children. God restores everything. Praise God. He restores. And I'm in, I'm in, uh, I had an encounter with him and the question was asked, what do you want? And I said, I want to be a disciple just like John, just like Peter to that level. And he said, here's what's required of you. And so at that point, I began to learn as hard as I could. I I learned Hebrew. I learned everything I could learn to hear it the way he would say it Mm. to John. And that's how it all began. So now, it, and then it develops and grows into something that I'm sure you couldn't have imagined. Where I think you said you were at a stadium, you're at a ball game, yeah. and you get an interesting phone call that kind of launches uh, this into existence. Tell us about that phone call. All right, I'm I'm watching a football game in college, college football game. My son is on the team. He's down there on the sidelines. We're looking at him, and uh, the phone rings. And I showed Michelle. I, I said, "Look at this." It was Kenneth Copeland, and I said, "Yes, sir." And he says, Greg, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me. Okay. And so I'm looking. <laughs> I'm running all across the stadium trying to find a quiet place in a football game. And he began to outline exactly what we're going to write. We're going to talk about the covenants. And the Lord told me to get with you, and we're going to partner on this thing. And it's going to be equal, and we're writing it together. And uh, when it was over, that phone call it was surreal. This is this really a real thing? Did that just happen? And uh, well, you have it in your hand. Uh, we over a period of time came together and wrote God, the covenant, and the contradiction. What is that contradiction part? God, the covenant. So there's three parts to a covenant, Bishop. There are the words of the covenant. There's yes. the cutting of the covenant, mm-hmm. and then the promise or the seal of the covenant. Every covenant has all three of those things present in them. And so what's the contradiction? Well, Abraham had a contradiction. The contradiction was, I'm too old, and so is she. So anytime God promises you something, now people listen to this. If God has promised you something, there will be a contradiction to whatever he just said as to why this won't work. And you have to overcome that contradiction in your mind. This way you renew your mind. You have to overcome the contradiction to watch it be birthed as Isaac. And once you overcome the contradiction, that's called becoming fully persuaded. Once you're fully persuaded, it'll come to pass. It has to because God made the covenant, not us. So when when he makes this phone call to you and you guys agree to do this, what's the what's the end goal? especially in the middle of all that's going on right now. Why write a book? Because he, he doesn't put out books very often like this, like this. I mean, there's always ministry resources and tools that are coming out, but this is a thick and weighty, very well-researched book. What what was the, the reason for it? There must have been a sense of urgency to it. He did have a sense of urgency. And um, he has said since this, he wrote another book called The Blessing. Yes. And he said, this book, he said, this book probably should have come out before the blessing. He said, we've got people trying to walk in the blessing, but they don't understand their covenant rights. Wow. The blessing is part of the covenant. But if you don't understand covenant, you can be deceived. You can, the Satan can try to steal that blessing. And immediately Jesus said he would. The minute the word is sown, he immediately comes and tries to steal it. But once I know I have covenant right, then nothing, nothing changes at all. I mean, I am, I am fully persuaded at that point because of the covenant. And I remind him of his covenant. Jesus, the word says, uh, the father says, my covenant will I not break nor alter the things that have gone out of my mouth. He is absolutely, this is why Israel still exists. People ask me to, all the time. They said, can you prove that God's real? I go, yes, Israel. Yes, yes. That's it a, is the mega sign. It's, it is the sign. And they're a nation today called Israel, not called Palestine. They're Israel. Yeah. And the fact that they're here and the fact that Jews are still here is proof of his covenant and that he watches over it. 
And he, if he watches over them to that level, imagine how much he's watching over me at the same level because I'm in Christ now. I've been grafted into this covenant, this new covenant established on better promises. It's wonderful. And once you understand covenant, I'm going to say this. This is going to sound shocking to some people. Faith is easy. Once you understand covenant, healing is easy. Once you understand covenant, because it's not about me and my performance. It's about his performance and my faith in that. Yes. Because I have a covenant right to that. Well, the book goes into the Edenic covenant, the 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 Abrahamic covenant, the Noahic covenant, the Adamic covenant. I mean, it dives into all of this. What would you say to someone who says, you know, we don't need all of that. We're we're now in a whole new we're in a whole new covenant now, Pastor. We we don't need to understand all that stuff. I think you do, and here's why: <laughs> um, Adam and God. I, I would say this: Adam and Jesus walked with each other in the cool of the day, every day. Um, he breathed into Adam. He, he gave Adam the authority to name things. Mm-hmm. And once the transgression happened, Eve was deceived. Adam was not deceived. He knew exactly what he was doing. We fell. Yes. So we're here. He's here. There's no way back. Lucifer has won. This is up. This thing's over. But over a, over a series of covenants, each more progressive than the other, to use a, word if i may each one revealing more as we go we end up and here was the question is there a way back is there a path back to that place we once had yes and he'll do it through a series of covenants from eden and noah and well eden uh, noah abraham moses and then the new covenant david each one reveals something new, and it's all focusing our, our – so we don't miss who it is, so we don't miss it. It's all focusing us to this one person who will be born in Bethlehem, and he'll be the, the, the lamb slain who, who decided he was going to do it before the foundation of the world. Mm-hmm. And he we celebrated him this last Easter and his resurrection, a resurrection day. He he is that promised lamb. And that's what John said. Behold, the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. What you've been looking for in covenant. Here he is. Here's the Passover lamb. Here's the blood on the doorpost. There he is. I'm not worthy to baptize him, touch his shoes even. But there he is. So each covenant reveals a different aspect and makes it more clear so we can see it. On a, on a practical level, as people are diving deeper into this, and I think it's a fulfillment of end time prophecy that we're rediscovering these truths and this revelation. How do people distinguish between laws and ceremonies like, you know, don't mingle cloth, uh, not to eat certain kinds of shellfish, all that kind of stuff with the meatier matters and weightier matters that still apply to us today? I believe you get over to three, uh, four times a certain phrase is used in, um, because, see, I tried to go back to the other way. Right, right. I tried yeah. to convert and, and and become that. There is a a new priest. A new priesthood requires a new priest. A new priest requires a new way of doing things. We have a new priest now, after the order mm-hmm. of Melchizedek, not after uh, a Levite. Jesus was not a Levite; he was from the tribe of Judah. Yes. When you look, when you look at a verse, there's one phrase that's used four times in Scripture, and I believe Paul wrote all three of them in the New Testament, but I don't want to get into an argument about that. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, it changed Martin Luther's life. Mm-hmm. The just shall live by faith. It's a time period in Habakkuk that's very much like America and Israel today. The, the, the sinners are winning. Uh, the unrighteousness are excelling and the righteous are being marginalized. Um, th- none of this is working. And what did he tell? What did Habakkuk say? But the just shall live by faith. You'll see the exact same phrase in Romans. You'll see the exact same phrase in Galatians. You'll see the exact same phrase in Hebrews. And I believe that Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews, all written to the church in our age, are what I call the Habakkuk Trilogy. Wow. When you read the phrase in Hebrew, it does not say what it says in King James, but the just shall live by his faith. In Hebrew, it says the just by faith shall live. Mm. Changes everything. I'm justified by faith. I was trying to work faith. 
I was trying to work everything. I was on the hamster wheel. If you read it in the Greek, I thought, okay, let's look and see what the Greek says. I'm not a Greek scholar, but I asked one. I said, I'm seeing this. Is this correct? It says the exact same phraseology, not the just shall live by faith. I was trying to live by faith. I was working myself into the grave. It says the just by faith. That's how Abraham became justified, by faith. Anytime Jesus encountered a person, there's two people he said had great faith. Yes. It was the centurion and the Syrophoenician woman. What do they have in common? Neither one of them were Jewish. They were Gentiles. But they operated in faith. They didn't know they were operating in faith. Matter of fact, the centurion bishop, it had nothing to do with faith. That whole encounter had nothing to do with faith except at the very end, it was all about authority. Yes. And when he walked in great authority, he walked in great faith. My authority comes from Jesus and my covenant with him, his covenant with me. When I walk in that authority, I'm walking in faith. The people he he said that your faith made you whole never knew they were in great faith. They were oblivious to it. But he was the object of what they were looking at. If I can just touch him, Mm -hmm. I'll be made whole. And when you make him the object of your faith, because he's the author and finisher of my faith, that's covenant, Bishop, and it becomes easy. Everything becomes easy with an understanding of covenant. Because it's authority. You can't walk in the believer's authority if you don't know covenant. Wow. You're not, you're, it's, you're not getting your benefit package. See, there's no curse in Abraham's covenant, only a blessing. There's no curse. The only curse is I will curse those that do bad to you, which is actually a blessing, isn't it? Yes. The law is what brought all the curses in. And now if I'm in Christ Jesus, I'm taken back to Abraham's covenant of faith. I'm justified by that same faith. I ask Bible school students all the time, how were people in the first covenant saved or were they saved? Could they be saved? Majority of them tell me they could not be. And the majority of them then will say of the ones that could be, well, they did it by sacrifices in the temple. I said, no, the blood of bulls and goats cannot take. It was the blood of the spotless lamb. That ratified my covenant, and it's forever settled. I can't change it. You can't change it. God himself would have to change it. He won't do that. Additionally, what really comes out in the book is that covenant reveals the nature and the character of God. Absolutely. The unalterable nature and character of God. What are you, and in a moment, I want to ask you about what you see coming in 2024 prophetically, what you sense in your spirit, but. Who is this book for? Who needs to get this book right now? By the way, ladies and gentlemen, the link is in the description, and this is going to be a journey that will be transformative. It is 300 pages of pure meat that will be a blessing to you and to your family, so make sure you get a copy of it. But who should you, get a copy kind. of this book? Anybody that, has, anybody that has struggled and said there's got to be a better way. Anybody that's tried wow. to do this and it hasn't worked. Anybody that's still struggling with their faith, with their acceptance, with their feelings of inferiority, with anybody that's in that category, anybody that wants to go deeper with God, anybody that just wants to know about who he really is, what he's Mm. really like. Because once you understand what he really is, what he's really like, he sounds like his word. It's easy to hear his word. You'll begin to hear covenant all throughout the book. Yes. The entire Bible is about it. And you'll begin to see Jesus. Guys, it's all about Jesus. I am just a disciple of him. If we really walked at the level that we should be walking at, racism is not a problem in America. Mm. Because that's, guys, that's on us. We can't look to government to solve that. Uh, Division is not a a problem in America if it wasn't a problem in the churches. And I think it's vitally important for the church now. And when I say church, I'm not talking about a building. I'm talking about the body. Many are sick and weak and feeble among you because you don't rightly discern the Lord's body. I used to always repent at communion all the time. No, no, the body means my brother. Bishop, if I have something against you, I'm actually having something against Jesus. That's good. If I have something against my pastor, I'm way out of line and out of authority, and I'm out of the anointing flow. For my position in the body, he placed me in the body as he desired, as he willed. And I think for the church to come together, understanding covenant is vital uh, because it's covenant that birthed me. 
And it's covenant that saved me. It's covenant that keeps me. And it's covenant that has me seated at his right hand right now. Wow. It's going to make everything easier. It's going to make your spiritual journey easier. It's going to help you get victory in every area of your life. Everybody needs to get a copy of God, the covenant, and the contradiction. And in a moment, we're going to go over to Encounter Premium. I'm going to have an uncensored conversation with you about some things that are in the news from Biden's administration, their announcement on Good Friday to the eclipse to everything that's in the news right now that people need to know about. But first, spiritually, based off because you kind of you connect with all kinds of prophetic voices in the body of Christ. What are you hearing uh, that God is saying to the church going into 2024? And what should we expect? This is what I'm getting really strong. A line is being drawn. And you're going to have to choose now. You're literally going to have to make a stand what you're going to stand for. As Mm -hmm. for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You're going to have to literally do that. You're going to have, and it may, it may cause problems in your family, may cause problems with your job. I don't know what it's going to, I don't know what that means for you, but the line is being drawn. Those on my right and those on my left. The day of kind of just going with the flow is over. Mm. Um, are we going to serve church? Or are we going to serve Jesus? Are we going to church? Or are we going to Jesus? Are wow. we going to his presence? Or are we just going to be present? Yeah. Uh, the day of being a closet Christian is over. We, we don't need to pray in our prayer closet anymore. My sweaters are healed. I need, I need to live it in the streets now. And I believe that that line is being drawn. We saw it with COVID, Bishop. Mm-hmm. Yes. When when the churches were no longer, you know, valuable or they weren't the priorities, but the bar was and mm-hmm. and they locked us down and we handed over the key to them. They said, oh, look at this, because they always thought the church would stand up. And in many places, we didn't fully stand up because we didn't know. But now we know. And when you have knowledge of something, it's required of you. We're going to have to make a stand in the last days for righteousness and truth. Meaning, if it separates me, it separates me. But that's what Mm -hmm. I want. I want to be on his side and all things. But I really believe more than anything else's line is being drawn. Yeah. Yeah. No more Switzerland. everywhere. And it's time to choose what side of the line you're going to be on. No longer can we be fence sitters. It's time to get off the fence. It's time to get in the game and because the two-minute warning has been issued. And this is going to equip you for victory. God, the covenant, and the contradiction. The link's in description. Now, um, Pastor, we're going to head over to Encounter Premium where I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the news and what you've been covering and everything that's happening. But how can people connect with you? You know, past, uh, Bishop, I got rid of some of my stuff when I was a pastor because I, 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 like, I don't have a 501c3 anymore. I, I, I just, <laughs> you know, I just, uh, I've always been all in. Yeah. And so if I'm all in, presence driven at gmail.com is a, is a, is a address. Um, I do things on Facebook all the time. Uh, you hear with Brother Copeland on the program, Victory News. Yes. Um, I've never had that asking me how people can connect with me. I've never thought people wanted to connect. I think people with love me. so much what you're doing, and they connect with you on a very spiritual and and powerful level, and they just love to be able to follow you on social media and just kind of stay in touch with you and uh, hear your thoughts on these things. Because what a revolution has happened over the last few years, where we have gentlemen like yourself who understand God and the covenant of God and the Word of God, and you're delivering the news to us. I don't think we've seen anything like this in our generation. I don't know of it. It's it's a strange it's a strange place to be in in that regard. That because usually what will happen is Bishop, I'll teach two hours. I did this morning two hours of Bible college to students. Did you really? I did two hours this morning. Started at eight a.m. to nine, nine to ten, and I do that Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I leave there and go to a pre production meeting for news, and I have to switch hats from yeah. talking about things of the throne and and spiritual things and equipping uh, people for ministry and switch hats to talk about transgenderism. Oh. And and there are days, pray for me, there are days mm. that I say, if I have to do one more drag queen transgender story, I'm going to throw something at the wall. <laughs> you know, to, to come out of the anointing, the to go into that, to come back then to talk to you, to go back into um, yeah. the news this afternoon. It is. It's something I could not have handled years ago. But God in his grace, he graces you for what he's called you to do. 
And so I'm able now to kind of flip that switch um, and and report things mm. that are unsavory and things I don't like to report. But we try to do it in a spirit of faith. At the end, yes. we always pray. At the end, we always we always try to turn a verse if we can. I'm always looking, Lord, where are you in this story? Where are you? What's your answer for this? Well, it's very uh, easy I, in times like these to become a victim uh, when we're listening to the news. And you do a glorious job of making sure that everyone knows they're a victor. And this is yes. what they can do. And here's why you need to continue to trust God. Everything you do is also faith building, and we're so thankful. So um, we're going to head on over now to Encounter okay. Premium, and we're going to talk sure. a little bit. I want to ask you about what you were talking about at that Bible school class. And uh, we'll dig into some more um, uncensored material. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you go to EncounterToday.com, become a premium member, and you get access to all kinds of uncensored conversations. We're going to go do that now. Uh, Pastor Stevens, thank you so much. Thank you. God bless. If you believe we have crashed craft, as uh, stated earlier, do we have the bodies of the pilots who piloted this craft? As I've stated publicly already in my News Nation interview, uh, biologics came with some of these recoveries. Yeah. Were they, I guess, human or non human biologics? He asked me point blank, Have you read your Bible lately? And I said, Well, sir, I think I know what it says. And he said, Well, then you would know that these things are, are demonic. It turns out that actually, yes, these things have been shot down and crashed, and the U.S. government has the wreckage. There's just no question that some of the reports seem to tell of the sort of thing that you find in poltergeist phenomena. I mean, with artificial intelligence, we are summoning a demon. 